Tonight, the push for information on the father and son accused of plotting an attack in Toronto. Canadians have a right to know. As MPs agree to investigate how the suspects got into Canada, the ISIS propaganda video raising more questions. An unprecedented emergency declaration in Africa as MPOX cases surge. The reality is it's not going to get better just by kind of turning a blind eye to it. What we know about the dangerous new variant and a spike here in Canada too. And why a family in northern Manitoba walked for days to get home. What the F am I doing out here? Now they're speaking out about their trek and the vital lifeline their community depends on. From CBC News, this is The National with Christine Bera. Thanks for joining us. Adrian is away. As police dig for answers in the case of two men accused of plotting a terror attack in Toronto, MPs are now on their own hunt, voting unanimously to investigate how the men got into Canada in the first place. The father and son are facing nine charges in total, including one laid against the father, linked to an alleged incident outside of Canada years ago tied to the Islamic State. A video that appears to show that brutally violent attack has surfaced online. A warning, we will show some images from it, but not the most disturbing. Thomas Daig walks us through it and the growing need for answers in Ottawa. An ISIS propaganda video recorded at least nine years ago showing this man carrying out a gruesome attack is now at the centre of an Ontario criminal case and sparking fresh questions about what Ottawa knew and when. Canadians have a right to know how a reported terrorist got into the country and not only that, was given citizenship. Ahmed El Didi and his son Mustafa El Didi each appeared in court again separately, both facing terrorism charges over an alleged mass murder plot in Toronto using an axe and a machete. Both spoke Arabic, confirming that they haven't yet retained lawyers. Hi, Thomas Dagg, CBC News. We went to the family's home and met a man who identified himself in English as Mustafa's brother. Are you able to tell me anything about uh, Ahmed El Didi's involvement with ISIS? No, I'm sorry. I can't. No? What about the, the video? Have you seen it? No, I have not. In that ISIS video, an attacker dressed in black is seen using a sword to strike a man who's tied up and motionless. CBC News is only showing still images due to the video's graphic nature. The attacker's face is seen clearly but only briefly. We've learned the video was posted online in June 2015. The same month, court documents show Ahmed El Didi is now charged with aggravated assault outside of Canada linked to the Islamic State group. I call this meeting to order. In Ottawa, MPs met urgently, agreeing to further examine how the elder El Didi was allowed into Canada, despite claims he took part in that alleged atrocity abroad. Some of the information that's going to be able to be shared will be limited because obviously we want the police and prosecutors to have a successful outcome of their case. The 26-year-old El Didi is seen here in newly obtained undated Facebook pictures. Police say he does not have Canadian citizenship, but his father does. And Thomas, the RCMP shared a bit more information today about their investigation. Yeah, the commanding officer for Ontario confirmed to CBC News that the RCMP was not aware of this alleged terror plot in Toronto until CSIS shared intelligence in July. And uh, the RCMP is not denying reports that that intelligence initially came from a foreign ally of Canada's. Um, the police say right now they're analyzing uh, data extracted from cell phones and other devices uh, in this investigation, potentially for further evidence. I should say, Christine, the federal government has said that they are going to make public a timeline of security screenings for the two accused in this case. But today's spokesperson said it's not ready yet. All right. Thanks, Thomas. You're welcome. A manhunt is underway in Alberta after a deadly carjacking near Calgary. It happened after the suspect set a stolen car on fire, then attacked a man who pulled over to help. Aaron Collins now on the ongoing threat and the concern in the community. This intersection, ground zero for a murder and a manhunt. Two suspects on the run for nearly a week before Mounties made an arrest 300 kilometres away in Edmonton. The RCMP have charged Edmonton resident, 35-year-old Arthur Wayne Penner, with first-degree murder. 
The victim, Colin Hugh, an innocent bystander, gunned down. Police say this man is still on the run. Elijah Strawberry is to be considered armed and extremely dangerous. If seen, do not approach, just dial 911 immediately. But Mounties won't say where they're looking for him. It's a little concerning. A worry back near the scene of the crime. So it's pretty quiet here right now, but a week ago, different story. That's right. It was a little chaotic with all the emergency vehicles using this road going up and down and the sirens, which living out in the country, you don't hear. So when you do hear it, you know something serious is happening. It's a bit scary. It is very scary. Those initial fears stoked by a lack of information. It could have been a little bit better, especially when you find out that they're still on the loose and you're just not sure where. In Edmonton, where the first arrest was made, there are questions too. Just anything that might give us an idea uh, of where they might be going, where to look. What other information they have to maybe assist the public in locating these indiv individuals. The RCMP has led several high-profile manhunts in recent years. Still, communication with the public while pursuing a suspect, no easy task, according to this retired investigator. People expect information just like that. Now, that's the sort of Internet-era way of thinking. And, and I think that's what's happening is people are justifiably frustrated that they have questions and they don't have answers. While police are saying little about the search for their suspect, they are speaking directly to him. Mr. Strawberry is watching. I would like to ask him to peacefully turn himself in to the nearest law enforcement agency. What's still unclear, whether their suspect is listening. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. There's growing concern tonight about the resurgence of MPOX, a new potentially deadly strain of the disease spreading fast in Africa is prompting a continent-wide emergency declaration. And as Lauren Pelly explains, Canada is not immune to the threat. MPOX infections across Africa are skyrocketing, with more than 15,000 cases and nearly 500 deaths just this year, a 160% increase compared to the same period in 2023. Families have been torn apart. On Tuesday, a declaration of a continental health emergency from African health officials, the first of its kind. The pain and suffering have touched every corner of our continent. Mpox can cause painful lesions and in some cases severe disease. It exploded around the world two years ago, prompting the World Health Organization to declare an international public health emergency. Cases eventually calmed down. But the Democratic Republic of Congo in the heart of Africa has been a constant hotspot. International spread. That's where this Canadian researcher helped discover a serious new strain that's now spreading beyond DRC's borders. And the reality is it's not going to get better um, just by kind of turning a blind eye to it. And, and I feel that the last 18 months, we've, we've seen a lot of that. Countries around the world rolled out vaccines to combat MPOX during the global outbreak of 2022, but African nations have long been left out. Officials there are now calling for 10 million total vaccine doses. So far, they've only procured 200,000. I have triggered the process for emergency use listing of both vaccines. A World Health Organization emergency committee is also set to meet Wednesday to discuss the possibility of calling a second global emergency for MPOX. I hope that that will be, uh, you know, that, that will be the, the impetus to push um, larger organizations to move forward on this. The rising concern comes as cases are still simmering globally, including here in Canada. Officials in Toronto warn there's been a spike, nearly 100 new infections this year, five times the number seen during the first half of 2023. And we need, really need to encourage people. In a city where this physician says it's both smart and easy to get an MPOX vaccine if you're eligible. I think it's a, of grave concern that we're um, treating other parts of the world as though they are less important. And Lauren, I understand that officials in Africa were actually getting ahead of the World Health Organization today? 
Right, that uh, WHO emergency committee meeting is happening tomorrow. So we'll see if this puts added pressure on the WHO to call another global health emergency for MPOX, just like they did in 2022. And already some countries are stepping up, offering aid. The United States is promising to deliver vaccines. We'll see if Canada follows suit at some point. Um, and all this is really meant to prevent another jump in this virus going from Africa to other countries. Christine? All right, thanks for this, Lauren. Turning now to the Middle East, Tehran continues to reject international calls to hold back on a widely expected attack on Israel. And Sasha Petrosik shows us, amid the fear of Iran's next move, is uncertainty over talks on a ceasefire in Gaza. After airstrikes, anguish. The despair of a father who went to register the birth of his twins in Gaza four days old, only to find them and their mother dead when he returned. Now wrapped in shrouds at Al-Aqsa Hospital, remembered by their birth certificates. Israel says it was targeting Hamas fighters. Down the hall, doctors treat a five-month-old girl. She's the only survival from her family. All members of family, they were killed by this air force attack. As Palestinians dodge fighting, the international scramble for a ceasefire continues. The tension played out at the Security Council. Every time the world pushes for a ceasefire, Israel responds with a massacre. The most moral country in the world, the most moral country in the world, you listen? Palestinian representative. Israel finally walked out. With negotiations set for Thursday, the worry is something similar will happen. Hardliners in Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's coalition are pressuring him to walk away from talks too. Hamas has already said it won't attend because Israel keeps adding new demands. Meanwhile, Iran isn't backing down on its public threat to attack Israel after the killing of Hamas's top political leader in Tehran two weeks ago. And U.S. President Joe Biden says a ceasefire deal could be a way to keep the war from widening. That's my expectation. We'll see. Experts suggest Iran wants an excuse to avoid retaliating for the assassination. A ceasefire deal might be it. So that's, that's probably what the Iranians are pushing for. But as Gaza fighting continues, peace talks themselves are in doubt. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Ukraine claims it is pushing further into Russia, claiming more ground in the Kursk region with no sign it's falling back. We are expanding the area of active action, said Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. While glimpses of the battlefield appear to bolster Ukraine's claims of captured prisoners and seized Russian settlements, Russia continues to push towards strategic towns in eastern Ukraine. Tropical storm Ernesto is bringing heavy rain and high winds as it moves through the Caribbean. The storm is gaining strength and it may be upgraded to a hurricane in the next day or two. Ernesto is passing north of Puerto Rico and heading towards Bermuda. It's too soon to know if its effects will be felt in Atlantic Canada. Doctors across India are on strike, their protests spreading after authorities say a trainee doctor was raped and murdered while on duty. As Kayla Hounsel tells us, they're demanding better protection from violence in the workplace. Across India, thousands of doctors are demanding justice for a young woman who lost her life while she was at work to save others. A medical resident found dead in a hospital in Kolkata in eastern India Friday. It could have been me. It could have been any of us. Dr. Simran Kaur Daliwal is a second-year resident in a public hospital in Mumbai. She says there's no security, no surveillance, and no on-call rooms. We do 36 hours, 40 hours, 50 hours duty non-stop. We need to take rest somewhere. There is no place. The 31-year-old woman was reportedly doing just that, trying to take a rest in a seminar room when she was attacked. 
Police say the woman was raped and murdered and that a police volunteer has been arrested. We are demanding the death penalty for the criminal caught in the case, says this protesting doctor. India did execute four men convicted of raping and murdering a woman on a bus in Delhi in a case that shocked the world 12 years ago. The Indian Medical Association says more than 75 percent of doctors have faced some form of violence. Doctors are demanding a Central Protection Act that seeks to give them better protection and establish clear penalties for offenders. They also demanded that the investigation be transferred to the CBI, India's federal police, seen by protesters as more trustworthy than local police. Late Tuesday, a high court ordered that will happen. We are rather thankful and grateful to the honorable court that uh, the CBI has been now handed over the investigation. For now, the striking doctors are not backing down. They say they became healthcare workers to help people, but now they need help themselves. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, London. The CRTC is forcing some of the big internet providers across the country to share their fastest networks with smaller rivals. It's another bid to give Canadians more choice. But Anis Hadari shows us there are some big ifs. Canadians looking for internet service may have a few more choices soon. That is, if the CRTC has its way. The regulator is forcing the big phone companies with fast fiber optic networks to allow competitors to use them. Cable companies like Rogers aren't using fiber as much, so for now, they're exempt. But this means the smaller guys don't have to dig up their own lines. This is something that we fought for for years. I'm pretty confident that tech savvy will make fiber services available. The idea that you're going to have competitive ISPs building up their, their own infrastructure uh, to connect all Canadian homes, that ain't going to happen. It's not desirable. It's not economic. The goal is more players in the market, but whether that lowers prices depends on how much the CRTC lets the big companies charge for sharing. But it's really hard to say whether it's going to actually translate into more competition until we see those rates, which now we expect by the end of the year. In exchange for being forced to share existing fiber with smaller competitors, the big companies don't have to share anything they built from now on for five years. So basically, it's a head start uh, rule uh, that gives the incumbents a head start as if they need any more uh, incentives and favors. As for what those incumbents think, Bell and Telus didn't get back to CBC News, and the Canadian Telecommunications Association, which represents the big companies, said it didn't have a comment at this time. But the last time the CRTC made a similar move, Bell threatened to cut back on investing in fiber optics. As for when new competitors can start using those networks, the CRTC says it wants to see that by next February. Anise Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. One year after a devastating wildfire in the Northwest Territories, a community is still struggling to move forward. Nothing. This used to be houses. Calls for more support to help people rebuild. Plus, demands for better rail service. A Manitoba family spent two days walking home after their train was canceled. That train it's our lifeline. It's what keeps us going. And slow but steady, the unlikely escape from a ranch in Arizona. We couldn't believe he had gone that far, and he was motoring. He was very determined, obviously. We're back in two. Homes gutted and land left charred just north of Athens after wildfire tore through the area. At least one person was killed and thousands forced to evacuate as the flames reached as high as 25 meters. Officials say the fires are now easing thanks to a shift in the wind. The immense scale of the destruction from the wildfire that tore through Jasper is becoming more clear tonight. 
The town says it has suffered about $283 million worth of property damage, adding 358 structures have been destroyed. Those numbers come as residents are preparing to return home with the evacuation order set to be lifted Friday. Though an alert will still remain in place and the near, nearby wildfire is still considered to be out of control. It's now been one year since wildfire tore through the community of Enterprise Northwest Territories and residents are still wrestling with how they can begin to rebuild. But as Natalie Pressman shows us, some aren't sure they want to. The hamlet of Enterprise is celebrating its 25th annual jamboree. For some, a reunion after last summer's wildfire forced the entire community of about 100 residents to evacuate. But just one road over, lots sit empty, scattered with belongings that survived the fire. Nothing. This used to be houses. 90% of the hamlet was destroyed, and Kathy Kimball is the only resident to rebuild so far. She says it's lonely. When you're used to a school bus going by, you know it's a weekday. And you could hear kids at that time. Now you just lose track of time because there's nothing to um, jog your memory to what day it is. Insurance helped Kimball rebuild, but many residents didn't have any. We didn't insure because we couldn't afford it. Genevieve Clark is living with her daughter in Hay River. She wants to rebuild an enterprise, but doesn't think she can afford it and wonders how much of the community can. About 40 percent were uninsured. And if we lose 40 percent of the money, we have for running the community that's not, I don't know if we'll survive. Enterprise's mayor says there needs to be more support, particularly for the uninsured. The government has to, and this is the federal government, has to come up with a plan where natural disasters are declared differently under the insurance policies. Lots are being cleared for those who want to return, but others aren't sure. You know, the deck used to be here and the fire came through so hot. That this is all that's left of Winnie Kaju's gift shop. This community was home for 40 years, but starting over feels daunting. How am I ever going to come back and have any semblance of the life that I had here before? It's pretty much impossible. A year on and still so much uncertainty about the future of this once tight-knit community. Natalie Pressman, CBC News, Enterprise Northwest Territories. With students heading back to school, there's renewed concern over nicotine pouches and how easy it is to buy them in Canada. There's no age limit, so if a toddler could reach up to the counter, legally they could buy it. We break down the concerns and what parents need to know. Plus, the sweeping plan to keep wildfire from reaching the city of Whitehorse. It's a big change for sure. I would argue it's necessary in this context. How reshaping a forest could reduce the risk. The National breaks down the stories shaping our world next. For the community of Puckatawagan, Manitoba, the twice-weekly train service is a lifeline. It's the only way to commute in or out. But residents say that vital link is unreliable and often cancelled. And as Karen Paul shows us, it recently left some walking for days in sweltering weather to reach home. Hey, what the hell are you doing out here? That's John Colombe filming his wife and 18-year-old nephew as they trudged nearly 100 kilometers along a rail line in boggy terrain just to get home. 12 miles to go. On Thursday, Colombe and about 70 other people were waiting here in the Paw, Manitoba for the twice-weekly train to Puckettawagan. But the train was cancelled, something Colombe says happens all too often. It's been getting worse, maybe twice a month once a month. So they got a ride as far as the highway would go and started walking. The first four miles, it was good. You know, your feet weren't, um, they weren't hurting yet. The first night, they slept outside a railway camp. I kind of asked myself, what the, f excuse my language, what the F am I doing out here? Thankfully, we didn't run into a bear, but we did see a lot of bear, bear droppings, big piles of it. 
By Saturday, they ran out of water. After a while, we started getting white around our mouth. We were, you know, we were totally dehydrating. Passing rail workers gave them food and water, and women from their community walked to meet them. About 1,800 people rely on this rail service. Colomb says it's unreliable, and he wants action. Give us proper rail service, one that's guaranteed to bring us back home, guaranteed to bring our groceries in, our building supplies, our gasoline. The Puckettawagan rail line and train is owned by the Kuwaitan Railway Company, but the contract to provide crew is through the Arctic Gateway Group. That company blamed the cancellation on a crew issue. It's one of these summer staffing issues. We apologize. It, uh, it's one of these things that are un uncontrollable at times, and we're working towards improving. John Colomb hopes so. That train, it's our lifeline. It's what keeps us going. And he doesn't relish another two-day walk home. Karen Pauls, CBC News, The Paw, Manitoba. Now it's time to break down the news shaping our world. A Canadian first in the battle against record-breaking wildfire seasons. A northern city tries to fight fire with trees. In the next five to ten years, you'll see a sea of aspen. Using natural infrastructure to save homes and lives. But first... You just feel a little energized, um, happier, uh, almost focused. As back to school looms, what parents need to know about nicotine pouches, why they are still so accessible to many children, and why kids are so vulnerable. There are a lot of questions about how this product ended up in convenience stores with no age limit, accessible to young people. David Hammond, you know a lot about these products and their approvals. What happened here? Well, essentially, these products have gone through a different regulatory channel in Canada. In Canada, We call it the Natural Health Products Act. That's typically things like sunscreens and herbal remedies. And essentially, what we had is the tobacco company that has been selling cigarettes to Canadians for a century put this product through and do it in a way where there's no age limit. So if a toddler could reach up to the counter, legally they could buy it. Uh, they're promoting it with lifestyle advertising, the types of imagery and ads that we've seen for vapes and cigarettes. Uh, and they've been doing it with very few warnings and information. And so it's a little bit like going back in time and seeing the same sorts of marketing uh, that we've seen for other nicotine products. And we know that these are the practices that appeal more to young people than, for example, the adult smokers who they're ostensibly targeted at. And David, I've talked to you about these products before. They look like this, like you said, very colorful marketing. The little pouch is just this big and people put it in between their lip and their gums. Very discreet. What's your sense? How much are kids using these products? Well, we see lots of anecdotal information from kids talking to social media. Uh, we've been tracking this. Now, some of these products have only been on the market for about eight, nine months, but I can tell you that we're following it. We're in the field actually right now. And our preliminary findings suggest that they are, it is going up in kids. We've seen about twice the number of kids as we did about eight months ago using them. And we see and hear that they're using them for things like playing sports, for you know studying or getting energy. That looks very different than what they're supposed to be used for, which is to help adult smokers to quit. I've seen that anecdotally on social media as well. For a medical perspective, we have pharmacy professor Leslie Phillips. Leslie, what is your biggest concern? Concern about these pouches? It's definitely uh, the uptake by uh, youth and the Im potential impacts of uh, nicotine use in individuals who don't smoke. What are some of the impacts of nicotine on teenagers? Yeah, um, so um, youth definitely are more susceptible to developing nicotine addiction. So I think there's a concern that using products uh, like Sonic can lead to dependence on nicotine, uh, making it more challenging uh, for people to quit later on. Uh, definitely concerned about the impact on the developing brain. Our brains don't fully develop till we're in our mid twenties. So the part of our brain that can experience and enjoy addiction is fully developed at age, about age 12. But the part of our brain 
um, that has a bit of uh, common sense or critical thinking, weighing the pros and cons, risky behaviors, probably doesn't develop till about the mid 20s. So you've got an individual able to experience the pleasure of drugs like nicotine, but probably not able to adequately you know, weigh the, the pros and cons of those decisions. And it looks like nicotine use in that age population may actually impede the development of, of the brain, especially the areas that are involved with critical thinking, uh, judgment, problem solving, uh, memory, attention, and learning. And uh, that effect may be irreversible, and if so, it could have a long-lasting impact. Leslie, I'd um, imagine that's uh, scary to hear for a lot of parents. As kids head back to school, there's peer pressure there. How do parents address this? Well, I don't think a lot of parents really understand the impacts of, uh, of these products. And in some cases, it's parents that are, you know, buying the products. Um, you know, both vaping, um, um, both vapes uh, and nicotine pouches, uh, thinking that they're not harmful. You know, when nothing could be further from 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 the truth, they also have you know significant impacts on um, on mental health. So, uh, using nicotine in youth has been associated with increased anxiety, depression, uh, problems with mood and with sleep regulation. And the tobacco industry really markets these products to youth as a stress reliever. But nicotine is a stimulant. It's not a stress reliever. It increases your heart rate. It increases your blood pressure. It's the very opposite of stress relief. I, I think your point that parents really do need to start talking to kids about some of these impacts is important. David, the tobacco companies have found a loophole. It's a lot tougher to deal with this now that they're already on the shelves. What would you like to see happen? Look, we need to get past this scenario where the government's always playing, you know, catch up with the industry. They've announced, the government's announced that they're going to restrict potentially advertising where these are sold. And the objective is to actually make them less appealing to kids and more appealing as a cessation aid to our four or five million smokers who need more help and might benefit from a less harmful substitute for smoking. So that's the goal, and we'll just have to see how quickly it acts and, uh, and, and whether it achieves its objective. The minister had talked about taking action back in February. We haven't seen much. We also haven't seen much on the vaping front. How optimistic are you? Well, I would just say that time is not our, our ally here. We should be framing these products as therapeutic products to help smokers who need help. Uh, and every month that you leave them on with the marketing, with the ads, with the packaging, it's going to do the opposite. And it, and it frames these products not as something a 50-year-old will use to quit smoking, but something a 15-year-old takes to the party with them. And, and uh, you know, there is an urgency to this. A really important conversation. David Hammond, Leslie Phillips, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. CBC News reached out to the health minister about that legislation to restrict access. He said they are still committed to moving on this quickly with measures including moving nicotine pouches behind the counter and requiring all advertising be approved by regulators. Next, the ambitious project to try to protect Yukon's capital from wildfire. It's just so much fuel to burn here. There's just so many trees. Juanita Taylor takes us inside the plan to redesign a forest to try and prevent fire from reaching Whitehorse. picturesque mountain town devastated by wildfires for returning Jasper residents a grim reality. Quite a lot of extensive damage so we're waiting to see um, what that looks like going forward. Other forested communities worry they could be next. If there's a strong south wind blowing and I smell any hint of smoke I'm a little bit nervous. But in Whitehorse there is a huge project underway aimed at protecting an entire city. As we first showed you this spring, Juanita Taylor got an inside look at how it works. There's no shortage of spruce trees around here. Spruce trees can burn really well. 
Deep in the boreal forest outside Yukon's capital, the race is on to build a massive permanent fuel break. Among the first in Canada. This area just south of the city of Whitehorse is being forever changed. Old spruce and pine trees are being cleared to create a massive corridor called a fuel break. It's kind of the balance, eh? Like I understand people hate to see that kind of clear cutting. It's a big change for sure. I would argue it's necessary in this context. But can you really wildfire proof an entire city? I'm about to find out. Most Yukoners live here in Whitehorse, known as the Wilderness City. About 36,000 people. And just outside the city stands the biggest threat of wildfire, spruce and pine trees. The Yukon government is trying to do something about it. So where are we heading to? So we're gonna head south on the Copper Hall Road, uh -huh. um, down to the Mary Lake area. I took a drive with experts on this project, Luke Bebo and Jennifer Sharp. It's pretty much exclusively uh, pine and spruce around here. The fuel break follows an old mining road. This is a huge clearing of trees right here. If a fire were to burn in this area towards Whitehorse, how realistic is that probability? I, I think it's an inevitability, to be honest with you. Yukon's government plans to spend $11 million to build the fuel break. When finished, it will stretch 20 kilometers long and up to two kilometers wide, thinning some areas, clear cutting others, and replanting them with slower burning trees. Its location is strategic. Most of the time, the wind comes out of the south out of the Carcross Valley in the Marsh Lake area in the summertime, it's like 80% of the time. Blowing right towards Whitehorse. There hasn't been a fire in this area since somewhere around like 1908. So it's almost time for it to happen. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. The big worry is a catastrophic fire like this. An assessment done a few years ago found that a Fort McMurray type fire could hit Whitehorse and likely will. Lightning strikes have also increased with the changing climate. Not wasting any time, the Yukon government started building the fuel break in 2020. Nearly 400 hectares of trees have been cleared and sent for salvaging. So Luke, there is just so much fuel to burn here. Like, there's just so many trees. Yeah, it's, it's uh, pretty wild how dense it gets to be, right? So this is exactly what it looked like before we went in. It's a big change for sure. I would argue it's necessary in this context. Those tiny needles packed with resin can become volatile with fire. As a fire is burning along the ground, maybe it's burning this moss or this leaf litter that we've got here. As those flames grow, they reach up and they climb this ladder. They climb the ladder fuels and they go all the way up the tree. They torch off in those really aggressive, scary looking crown fires. Mm -hmm. They're kind of our, our worst enemy in some ways, but they're also part of the, the ecosystem. I'm constantly concerned about it. I know that the fire seasons are getting longer. We've had more and more severe events. Sandy Johnston's home is just across Mary Lake, less than two kilometers from the fuel break. So Sandy, hot days are coming. What do you think about when it's a hot day out here? Well, if it's low humidity for a few days, if it's above 25 degrees, and if there's a strong south wind blowing and I smell any hint of smoke, I'm a little bit nervous. He's been fire smarting his property more and more every year, like rigging up this vacuum to suck leaves from the roof. We've been in full support of the development of the fuel break. It's something that uh, we're kind of grateful to see uh, being developed, but at the same time, there's a lot of concerns, I guess. And there may be a fault sense of security from, an, from the residents of Whitehorse that the fuel break's gonna save us from a wildfire, which it's not. Uh, the biggest threat to the community will be from an ember shower. Last summer you saw embers go across the Okanagan Lake. Part of the planning is to keep ember showers like this from reaching so far. By redesigning the forest and replacing spruce and pine trees with aspen. So Jennifer, tell me more about this guy. 
so we source the seed from Fort Knox. Jennifer Sharp is a forester working on the fuel break. In the next five to ten years, you'll see a sea of aspen. Prescribed burns like this one help prepare the land for hundreds of thousands of aspen seedlings. Talk about why aspen is so important. Aspen don't burn as well as the trees we see in the background, which are conifers. So pine and spruce, they're more fire resistant. They don't have the ladder fuels that bring surface fire up into the trees and, and make fire behavior more intense. And so these species in particular are great for reducing the fire intensity if a fire was to approach this area. To really see the magnitude of the project, I joined this Yukon government reconnaissance flight. The first of the season. We've been working on this project for, I think about four years now. Mike Fancy and his team go up regularly to see how things are shaping up. If it weren't for the fuel break, if there ever were a fire in the area, we would have to put the bulldozers in the ground really quickly, get down to mineral soil as fast as possible. Because of this work, not only are we able to do so with more consultation and more collaboration and less potential environmental consequence, um, we're able to do it on our terms. There's a lot at stake when it comes to protecting Whitehorse. It's the major transportation, service and government centre for the entire territory. People are really anxious, there's no two ways about it. The Minister of Community Services, Richard Mostyn, says the fuel break is only one tool to protect the city. Of course the Yukon is known for its beauty, its wilderness. Why then is it so important to, to forever change the landscape? I call this living infrastructure, really. So basically what we're doing is making these changes to our landscape because we're seeing the threats of, of our changing climate so profoundly here in the north. I mean, it's happening here faster than anywhere else in the country. Is it enough? Will it be enough? The short answer is no, it's not enough. The fire smarting is another very key point. You know, we all have a responsibility to play in the face of the challenges we're seeing through climate change. In another part of the city is where I meet up with Gary Bailey. So we're actually an urban First Nation, which is kind of a unique situation. A right? member of the Kwanlin Dunn First Nation. My lifestyle and my, the way I live my life is about the land. Everything I do is connected, so it means everything to me. Bailey says his First Nation was involved in the planning process to build the fuel break. It's, it's kind of the balance, eh? Like I understand people hate to see that kind of clear cutting and stuff like that, but what would really impact everybody directly is if a fire came through and wiped everything out. Then not only is the forest gone, and, but so are the animals, and so are the berries, and so are all the plants, things that sustain us are gone too, right? There's a lot at stake. Another thing that's really cool. Officials say they are anticipating a normal fire season, but last year there was a record-breaking 207 wildfires. It's certainly not to say that the risk is gone. We need to just kind of stay vigilant, uh, but I don't live in fear of this stuff. I think we have to have a healthy respect of fire and a humble relationship to it. And just yesterday, Yukon's wildland fire crews performed a prescribed burn along the fuel break location. They plan to do two more before the end of the year. Up next, a tortoise hatches an escape plan. He was motoring. He was very determined, obviously. The hunt for a runaway reptile in our moment. They're not known to be particularly fast or sneaky, but a tortoise named Stitch is in the spotlight tonight after a masterful escape from a ranch in Arizona. It happened after a storm blew through, fences at the ranch were damaged, and next thing, Stitch was gone. Tonight, his audacious escape makes our moment. We found out that he was gone. Everyone scattered out and started looking for him. Someone called in to the highway patroller 911 said there's a tortoise running across the highway. The sheriff's officers came out. They caught him and had him on the side of the road where he couldn't get injured and no one else could get injured. Hey, 
couldn't believe he had gone that far. Because not only did he get out of his tortoise village exhibit, then he went through a whole other pen or fences that surround the feeding area here at the ranch. And then from where we found him and where he got out, he crossed several more fences as well, as well as some ditches and other stuff. He was motoring, he was very determined, obviously. And Stitch is the, was definitely the baby of the group. And he's about 14 years old, uh, but they're all males. And I think he was just maybe ready to go find a girl. He was tired of all them boys. I don't know, I don't speak tortoise. So he has a home here. And so now he's really gonna be famous. I love that. I don't speak tortoise. The lengths living things will go to to find love or at least a mate. And it's a good thing he was saved. Stitch belongs to an endangered species. Well, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the National's YouTube channel. I'm Christine Birak. Take good care.